Hey, we're live, everyone. Welcome to the Get Good Podcast with Carol Freeman. This is the podcast for comedians that are serious about getting good. So whether you're trying to advance beyond the open mic scene or looking to get booked consistently at comedy clubs and beyond, this podcast is for you. I am your host, Carol Freeman, comedian. And on this show, I interview headlining comedians, club owners, bookers, festival judges, comedy instructors, and more to find out their best tips, techniques, strategies, so that you can improve your stand-up comedy and get good. And today, we have the one, the only, the amazing Kermit Apio, everyone. Hi, Carol. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. I have this here. Uh (laughs) (laughs) You didn't know what you were in for. So (laughs) I know a lot of you watching, listening, know who Kermit is. But if you don't, I'll just give you a little bit of his uh, bio, his backstory. So he's born and raised in Honolulu, Hawaii. And he enjoyed a childhood in paradise. He spent his time watching television, playing, and procrastinating (laughs) everything else. To this day, he still does all three extensively. And Kermit moved to Seattle to attend University of Washington, and he started comedy there the year that I graduated high school, 1989, (laughs) which, you know, is only just 10 years ago, right? right, Um, right. (laughs) Kermit's been doing comedy for over 30 years, and the fun thing is, is that his open mic is the same place that my open mic very first open mic was as well. Uh, Rest in peace, comedy underground in Seattle. And uh, so I can't wait to talk about that more too. And so in uh, just a year later, he quit his job and went comedy full time. So we got a lot to talk about there, how he made that transition. Um, He has won, let's see, he was a winner of uh, 2009 Great American Comedy Festival, numerous appearances on television and radio. He showcased in comedy festivals around the country. He's performed in 47 states, so I'm going to find out which three he has not. And uh, the three Canadian province, provinces, a past winner of Seattle Comedy Competition, 75 finalist in San Francisco Comedy Competition, and his greatest accomplishment, perhaps 1988, he was Dishwasher of the Month at SeaTac Airport Denny's. Is that place still there? It is still there. I, I, I often see it when I, when I fly out, and I think of it fondly. <laughs> That's so fun. So I'm so glad that you took the time out of your your schedule to be here. And uh, I look forward to chatting more for with you. So um, Mark Gilchrist. Uh, Hi, Mark. Thanks for being here, Mark. Yeah, if you're watching this, uh, just give us a comment. Let us know where you're joining from. And um, gosh, where where, where do we start, Kermit? So I've known of you the whole time doing comedy, but I was so lucky to get to carpool with you. You were kind of my Uber driver to a show that we were both on (laughs) earlier this year in Tacoma. And I got to uh, experience firsthand what everybody talks about is what a really great guy you are and just really nice. And we had some really good chats the whole way. So thank you. Thank you again for being here. Yeah, that's very nice of you to say. I appreciate that. You know, there's a lot of people in this scene and uh, everybody will say, certain things behind, you know, closed doors versus public and everything anyone said both places for you has just always been super positive. So good job at, at being a, a good person. And- well, that's, that's <laughs> nice, but I could, I could actually give you a list that would say otherwise. There okay. are there's a list of those people as well. <laughs> Maybe it says more about them than it does you though. So <laughs> we'll take us. Okay. So take us back to uh, that first open mic. We're going to, talk about 30 years of your life here so t- what what made you go and try that crazy comedy thing at under comedy underground well so i was always a fan of comedy when i was young my um it, it, you know if i didn't mess up during the week my parents would let me stay up on friday night and watch johnny carson and and i wouldn't fall asleep it was late for me but i would watch every minute and every friday and uh so i was always a big fan of comedy and and then in in college whenever Uh, And to some extent, high school, whenever I had a chance to like a creative writing class and to write something funny, I would try. It wasn't always funny, (laughs) but I always tried to write something more comedic than anything else. So anyway, I I was working for United Airlines uh, after my after my stint at Denny's. I I got in with United Airlines at the airport there and there was a guy on another shift who did open mic and sometimes got paid gigs. And and he was just a really kind of crazy and funny guy and everything got to know him um and he took me to open mic and i hung out uh twice two or three times i think and just hung out and watched and 
And then the fourth time, I think he knew I wanted to go up, but I was just too like scared and too nervous to, to, to say it out loud. So the fourth time, he said, hey, you want to go to open mic tonight? I said, yeah, I'd love to. He goes, do you want to go up? And I just kind of, you know, I, I wanted to say yes, but I, I, I wanted to say no. It was like, I, I'm not, I think so. I'm not sure. And he goes, yeah, just go up. And I said, well, I, I don't know. How do you do that? Kind of, how do you put, put a set together? And, and he, said, he said, he knew that I had all these, I had this notebook of all these little writings. And he said, just pick stuff, stuff from that. And, you know, maybe stuff that's personal that, that might, you think might be funny. And I said, I said, what if I don't have five minutes? And he said, then say good night. You not you don't have to do five. That's the maximum. <laughs> you know, like I didn't know. I thought I thought five minutes meant okay. You better do five minutes. And uh, he said, if you're done at three, uh, just say good night. No, nobody nobody needs you to do five. Just do whatever. You know, and that and so to have a friend take me and also because back then you know now you can find out all the information you want about how an open mic works mm. but back then you, you couldn't so for you had to actually go down to the club i mean you could call but they wouldn't tell you a lot they just say oh, i'll come down monday by seven o'clock and sign up that's all they would say and so to have a friend take me there and i got to watch him do it i watched him sign up at seven and then we would sit and hang out and talk and i got to meet his comedy friends you know um I actually kind of had an idea of how it worked. And so that helped a lot. So it was like my fourth time at the Comedy Underground, and I got to, I got to try it. Um, but, yeah, it was this, it's this buddy just kind of hanging out with him, and he dared me to go on. And there, was, uh, there were a few comics. There was one comic that's still a friend of mine today who was standing at the edge of the stage, and he said, you're going to keep doing this, right? And I was like, I, I hadn't even thought of All I could think about was, like, this one incredibly nerve-wracking experience. And then a few of the other comics – you know, told me nice job and, and everything. And I was, I was thrilled. And from that moment I was pretty much in. Okay. That's, that's a lot of times you get that, that dose of whatever you get on stage and you're like, Oh my gosh, I need more. Yeah. That's amazing. That that's interesting too. So the first time I did it was down to only three minutes because they had so many people that they were putting up at that point. So I can only imagine the growth of comedy yeah. over that 30 years. And, uh, I, I remember my very first, I, I was always a comedy fan. I'll just share mine if you don't mind. Uh, yeah, yeah, please. Um, that, uh, always a comedy fan as well. And um, I remember watching uh, Travis Nelson, who's still up in the Northwest Seattle area. And I would watch him. And I asked him finally, when I was like going to go do my first open mic, I'm like, where should I go? And he says, comedy underground. That's where you got to go. And I, I, at that, at that time, so this was about five and a half years ago, um, the they had a so monday night was the open mic and you got three minutes and if you did well they had a tuesday night callback show that they would invite you know it was like a booked showcase open mic yeah. type of thing yeah. unpaid thing and in my mind i you know and i'd written and i'd practiced my three minutes and in my mind i was so amazing and so great my goal was to get booked on that tuesday show so I go in there thinking like, I'm going to kill this and I'm, I'm going to know I was a success because I'm going to immediately get booked for that tomorrow show. And so I did my set and I'm like looking around like, where's the person that, that comes <laughs> up and books me? And uh, Travis was there. Travis Nelson was there and he's standing in the back. And I've learned since the, the, the code phrase that comics say when you didn't do that great. So he says, so how do you think that went? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, uh, okay, I guess it was okay. <laughs> and yeah. it took a full year of me doing comedy for me to be able to get booked on that Tuesday show. Yeah. And I found out it's not all the, the glory that I thought it was going to be. Yep. And, you know, there were like three people in the audience and, and I was just like, but I, you know, I finally <laughs> achieved my goal a year later being able to get booked on that Tuesday callback show. <laughs> I think, yeah, I think for most of us, there is a, it is a bit of a shock when you start to realize that, oh, I'm going to be bad at this for a while. Yes. It's a really hard <laughs> thing to say because when before you go, you think, all right, I'm, I've got some jokes, you know. And um, and then you really realize, you know, because luckily my first one, I got a few laughs. Not a ton, but I got a few laughs, which for a first timer is kind of huge, right? And then in the next few weeks, I realize, oh, I'm not that good at this. Like, I, I, <laughs> it was like, oh, my God, they're staring at me, you know, and. And, uh, okay, well, I better do this and do this. And you realize it's not about, like, oh, I'm going to be hosting in the next six months. I'm good. You can't. You can't do that. You have to literally, at first, you just have to say, okay, i got to figure out what all these other people know that I don't. 
and how that works for me personally, right? Because not everybody's strategy works for everybody else. So, so, but learning that is, is the beginning of learning that is to say to yourself, Oh, I'm not as far as I thought I was, you know, like it's, yes. it's humbling. And it, it really, that first year weeds out a lot of people, you know, that, right. You see a lot of people like they do it for a few months and they go, yeah, this is too much. Um, and, uh, but, but if you can get past that first year and all of a sudden you start to get a few more good shows than, than bad shows and, and, and you start to kind of feel, feel who you are, but yes, you, you go in not knowing that you go in, not realizing, oh, this is a process. Yeah. So, so take us back. So within a year of your first open mic, you went full time, you quit. No, it was more than that. It was about, it was a, a year and a half to maybe a year and a uh, year and eight months or so. It was, okay. It was, it was a while. Yeah. Still, pre- st- still pretty quick for comparatively yeah. to what you can do now. So what, but also it sounds like you were working, you know, maybe a minimum wage job. So maybe it was a little lower bar. It was, to... it was better than minimum wage and okay. it also had, it had flight benefits. I was working for United. So, oh. yeah, yeah. so it was kind of nice, you know, but, um, the, you, you know, just, just, so what happened was I, I got to try it. I, I had a month off, uh, because they were going to lay someone off. And I said, and I said, look, don't lay anybody off. Just it's the slow season. The busy season starts in, in about six weeks. Why don't you let me take a you know thing? And cause I had had people saying like, Hey, if you want to go do a gig in Yakima or Spokane, you know, and I couldn't at the time cause I just was working. And so for about six weeks, I called all these bookers and I said, Hey, I can do, you know, some stuff, you know, I can travel for about a month. And so I got a club in Spokane, which was a six night club at the time. Um, and, uh, all these one nighters and it was amazing, Carol. I was like, I'm, oh. I'm a working comic. I'm on the road. I'm doing, you know, like I get into the clubs for free. I could just walk in and say I'm a comic and they let me in. It was like, it was really just kid in the candy store type stuff. Like I remember sitting there and I, uh, I ordered something. And I said to the I said to the club manager I said hey can I grab my tab and he goes no 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 you get you get a you get two drinks and a and a food I wasn't like it wasn't like it wasn't like steak and egg you know steak or anything it was it was it was like cheese sticks or something chicken and strips I, is the joke right right, right. <laughs> and I literally said out loud to the other comics like I get this food for free <laughs> <laughs> like so for a month a month and a half I I I really felt like oh man this is this is incredible. And then I went back to work and I just felt so, I was, I mean, it was like, oh, I didn't, I didn't realize that comedy thing is fun. And here's the other part of it too. I was having a blast. I was, I I just, it was a great six weeks, but you know what, Carol, the gigs weren't good. They were tough one nighters. The clubs were fun, obviously, but on the Tuesday, Wednesday, the clubs, they, you you know, you were working kind of hard and I had way too many Seattle jokes. I was like, oh, how about our mayor? Huh? Like, and they they don't care. They don't. I'm in Yakima. I don't care about your mayor in Seattle. You know, it was, it was really so. So I had a lot to learn. But just being on the road and being a comic, it didn't matter that the gig sucked. It was like it was like, oh, that is more what I want to do. So, um, yeah. So that's that's kind of where it, where it where it came from. And then when I, when I so I went back for a few months, and and this is going to sound crazy, but at the time, emceeing paid four hundred dollars a week. So you could and you could do it. Yeah, yeah I know. <laughs> We talked like, about this a little bit when I was up there about how the, right. the pay has just gone. Yeah, yeah. So, so to host, you could do, you could host the, like the comedy underground for, you know, maybe five, six times a year. You could do it almost, almost every month or every other month or whatever. And you'd make $400. So, so, so I would be at work and I'd have like paychecks backed up that I haven't, you know, like for six weeks, I didn't pick up a paycheck. Cause I was just living off comedy cash. Right. Mm. And so that really pissed off my supervisors. They were so mad. <laughs> like they were like, And so they called me in and they said, you know, you better decide, is it comedy or United? I go, well, why do I have to decide that? I said, is my work suffering? And they said, no, but you do these things. Like you leave paychecks in the book. Like, I'm sorry, I'll come get the paychecks, you know? And, and they were really kind of getting at me. Like, you know, uh, you have to decide, you have to decide. And I said, okay, can I, can I have till tomorrow? And they just, Kermit, we lost we lost your microphone. I think. There we go. Oh, there. Uh, am I yeah. back? Yep. Okay. All right. Um, so anyway, but what I was saying is that I um, they really they really kind of grilled me. It's either United or Comedy. You better decide. And I said, Can I have till tomorrow? 
and then they just were like, "What?" Like, and um, and so I, I talked to my mom, who's a United lifer. Like, she spent thirty five years at United. Oh. And without her blessing, I wouldn't have done it. But she said, she said, "Yeah, uh, you know, if if you want to, just." And she said, "Just don't half ass it." She said, "If you're gonna leave all your." all your, uh, 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 everything behind, you're going to leave your benefits and all that. Don't half-ass this. And she said, mm. she said, and, and I told years later, I, I said, I said, I'm so surprised you gave me your blessing. And she said, you know why? I've never seen you try hard at anything until comedy. She said, that was the first <laughs> thing I saw you ever really work at. And That's kind of a backhanded compliment. It's Thanks. It's a very mom. <laughs> backhanded compliment. And it's a very Hawaiian mom compliment, and, oh. but, but you know what? She wasn't wrong. She's totally right. So she, so that's so, so the next. I typed that night. I stayed up. I typed up a, a, a resignation letter, very nice, thanking United for, you know, my my an opportunity to come out of college and have some have have a job and and um yeah it was really um and then and then I put in my two week notice. So, oh wow wow, yeah. rusty comedian, uh, Seattle area comic says Kermit is a beast. Uh, it's very nice, Rusty. It's been a long time, man. Good to see you. And congrats, he just got married recently, I saw. So congratulations, yeah, yeah. Rusty. Congrats. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and I, it's just, I think it your story, I've heard it a lot for, um, you know, comics that have been in it 20 plus years, just how it's so much different. Yeah. And, and I know, too, from my own experience, that your growth as a comic accelerates so fast, so much faster being able to go, you know, do consecutive gigs, you know, yeah. a week of gigs or something like that just that experience and you, you get so much better quicker than trying to do open mics. Yes. You know, 10 open mics in a week is equivalent of, I don't know, <laughs> one show on the road or something. Right. So having right. those opportunities that you had, you know, I can hear from your story of how you were able to, you know, within two years of starting comedy, be able to go full time is amazing. And it makes yeah. me really jealous of like, gosh, I wish I could, I don't know, go back or we could have the same opportunities that we have now. It's a very different uh, no, comedy I, world that we live in now. I completely agree. It was, it was a different time then. And also too, um, you know, uh, the triple run, the famous triple runs, David, David triple had anywhere from 35 to 45 rooms at any given time. So I could, Ooh. I could get in my car, drive, drive out to, you know, Missoula and start a three, a three week run where I was off maybe four days, you know, and I just sleep at a rest stop that night, and and uh, but and the gigs were hard. Some were good. Some some gigs, some of triple gigs were actually pretty decent, but many of them were really hard. But man, did you learn fast because mm -hmm. when you're standing on stage and and uh, you're in the middle of nowhere, and like I said, they could care less about your Seattle jokes. You write quickly. I mean, the next morning you have a three hour drive to the next town. You are thinking the jokes and jotting them down as you drive because uh, it it was it was fast learning because of that you know and then and then other people had a bunch of one-nighters too and there were more clubs back then so yeah I, i'm very lucky that you could and really at the time there were so many gigs that your job as an opener was to get the headliner to the gigs that was really mm. your main job and then talk for half an hour and as long as the, the crowd didn't absolutely despise you uh you could keep doing it and get better so it was a very different time and i was very lucky to start at that time Hmm. So you mentioned too, that one of the things you learned quickly at, during that time was minimize your local references, or if you're going to make, you know, people in Spokane aren't going to understand yeah. Seattle references. Do you remember anything else from that time of like kind of these big ahas that you had of, you know, things that you needed to change or improve to get better? Yes. Uh, well, there, there was a ton, but you know, there were things like, um, it wasn't just about the Seattle references. It was also the Seattle sense of humor, right? Mm. I, 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 uh, uh, you know, when I, when I came to Seattle, man, I was, I remember when the, when the Neptune, you know, would, would show like all these like crazy independent movies, which I didn't know existed in Hawaii. It was basically the popular movies, right? You saw mm -hmm. the, the top, the top movies. You didn't see art house films. I didn't know what that was. So when I came to college, man, I just fell in love with Seattle because stuff like that, where I got to see all these movies from different countries or different, different, you know, not as known directors that were great. And, and you know, just kind of the sense of humor about everything. And and uh, I, you probably don't know, but the, Almost Live was a comedy show that was on every Sunday, and it had the Seattle sense of humor. And so, it wasn't just about like me making Seattle references. I made jokes that were way too subtle for Pocatello, Idaho. Mm. They were way too dry. And I and still to this day, I have a dry sense of humor. A lot of my stuff is dry, but but I now know that it has to be sort of couched in different ways. So that Pocatello will, will go, okay, we'll follow you on this, right? Mm. And so 
and you realize you sort of realize okay what do i want to achieve in this right and i and i'm never going to be the the one nighter in idaho i'm never going to be their favorite comic but i can but i can do enough now where i know i can have a good show and that was that that had to be something i had to figure out um so it was things like that. It was just things like, how do I relate to people whose lives are nothing like me, right? Mm. There, there, there's a guy who's, you know, been uh, been out, you know, uh, bailing hay all day long, right? And he, they come in and he's got his f- dress flannel shirt on and you see his hands and they're just chiseled, right? And I'm not that person at all. How do I relate in some way to him? And man, that took a long time. What I started doing is doing some fish out of water jokes like just the idea of a hawaiian being in pocatello idaho where where's the humor in that right um uh one of my early fish out of water type jokes i ordered a i ordered a chowder somewhere in like utah or idaho and it was really bad and the other <laughs> comic the headliner who's from seattle was laughing he goes you live in seattle you order chowder and now you're complaining about it here? <laughs> like he goes you thought where, where's the nearest clam live and i started <laughs> i started laughing right and it was stuff like that where I realized, oh, yeah, that's that to them can be funny. Like, I came here and I knew nothing about it. Here are my assumptions. Here's where I was wrong. And that's where the humor. So mm-hmm. it was it was really about finding the connection between me and them because, man, I did not know those people at all. Right. I grew up on an island and, and, and then I moved to a you know very cosmopolitan, very, you know, uh, Seattle. And, and then all of a sudden I'm in these small towns in Montana, Idaho, Utah. And having to relate, and man, that's that was that was a fun thing to do. But boy, it took years. Mm. I do actually remember almost live. I moved to Seattle in '93. Okay, and so I got 27 years up there. I remember almost live was what played after Saturday Night Live, so yep. it was on very late. And I the skit I remember is the high five and white guys that right. they right. <laughs> right, right, and the whole the whole sketch was based on you know five very white guys just doing something or being somewhere that's exciting and they all high five and it was a very yeah. funny bit um yeah. but it was also silly and right and you can't go to these country bars in the middle of nowhere and do stuff that's silly you have to kind mm. of have some have some bite to what you're doing right right yeah okay so ta- uh, you know continue on your your journey your uh you know what were some of the milestones then that you hit after that doing the the triple runs and well, okay, the big milestone, 1991, uh, I, I won the Seattle Comedy Competition. And, I had, and I'm not kidding or, or exaggerating. I had no business winning it. It was, it was really one of those things where um, it was my, I think it was the third year I did it. I think I did it two years w- when I had my day job. Mm. And, um, but then the third year I, I did it, I had been on the road a bit. Mm. Um, and and I really, I'll tell you this, with two nights left to go in prelims, the first round, I was asking people who were making the semifinals, hey, are you canceling any gigs next week? Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm free. <laughs> and and I, w- I was in ninth place with two nights to go, and I squeaked into fifth place the very last night. I um, mm. was in a tough room, a room that I didn't normally do well in. And I won it, which is bizarre. I actually won the last night, and that put me by a few hundredths of a point into fifth place. So I was lucky to make the prelims, and um, and, and and then I made the finals. So uh, so, and I was very lucky to win that. Um, I talked to one of the judges uh, a couple of years later, and he said something interesting. He goes, "You were the only one that that didn't look." Oh, I think your mic again. Shoot, I'm so sorry. I think it's your your cord on the end. Because when you, yeah, there you go. Yeah, I think I got a bad cord. Ah, that okay. sucks. Check, check. All right, yeah, you back. You're good. You're good. Yeah. All it's right, just so, like a, you've been on those stages where yeah. you're talking and then the cord falls out of the mic. I think that's I know, what I, you. I, I literally just used this cord at a music gig the other night. Like it's, I did. Oh. I, I had no idea it's going bad. Okay. So, uh, but what I was saying was that uh, I made the finals of the competition and I really was like, I, you know, I was the kid who was lucky to be on finals and and I, and I was happy to be there. And, but what it turns out was, so they were saying, okay, you have 22 minutes max. So first light goes at 20, second light goes at 21. If you see both lights at 22, you, you've, uh, uh, I don't know if you disqualified or whatever, you can't go over 22. Um, and I said, uh, what's, what's the minimum we have to do? <laughs> cause, cause, 
I did not want to go back into my open mic material, right? And so he said, well, you have to do 18. And I go, and what is that like? <laughs> and so I was thinking, man, do I bring in bits that I kind of have dropped? You know what I mean? Like after open mic, you kind of drop bits that were like, eh, mm-hmm. those weren't, those are kind of embarrassing now. But, and I thought, no, I, you know what I'll do? I'm going to talk slow. And and so a couple of years later, when I, I talked to one of the, I met one of the judges, he told me that he said, we all thought that you were the least nervous. I go, I was the most nervous by far. <laughs> and he said, everybody else was talking so fast. And I said, because they were trying to get as many jokes as they could get in. I was trying to save jokes. But by talking slower, I looked like I was comfortable. And it really, mm. it really worked. And um, Okay. So there's a good tip. Talk yeah, slow. <laughs> yeah. And, and I'm, and I'm, by the way, I'm the reason there's more than one night of finals. I just want to point that out. Cause, cause back then was one night I caught lightning in a bottle and I, I couldn't believe it. I was surprised I won. And all of a sudden there's two nights of finals and three nights. And now there's like, I think five nights of finals, but, and what happens with what that does is that it, it really does say that, okay, that the kid that catches lightning in a bottle won't catch it five nights in a row. <laughs> so, mm. so, so it, it does kind of make the, 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 the quality kind of, you know, the demand of quality goes up rather than just one night. So yeah, I'm one of the reasons that there's multiple night of finals, <laughs> if not the main reason. <laughs> oh, they want it well. Yeah, well, oh, it... I, I should tell you this. So so you back then you had to headline a weekend at the underground if you won. You, the head, they'd okay. have the winner of the competition would headline a week. Well, okay, had... you said you had to instead of you got to. <laughs> 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 you got to. <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> And, and get this. So I had about maybe 30 like that, you know, and and that's bringing in some of those jokes that I was trying to drop. Um, and so I said to, I said to the guy who ran the comedy underground, I said, do you want me to feature that weekend? And he goes, we can't feature the winner of our competition. (laughs) He goes, goes, what does that say about us? If we can't put it. And I said, I've never headlined. So, so he said, look, do your thing and say goodnight. If it's 35, say goodnight. Don't, I don't want you doing where you're from. You're, you're not good enough at that yet. You're, you're too new to, to be riffing to fill the time. So, so just say goodnight. And yeah, so, so I headlined in December. And you know what the funny thing is? I emceed it in March. Won the competition November, headlined December. So I never featured the underground. I went from MC to headliner in like six months. So, oh, wow. so when you ask it, what are my milestones? That was huge because I had to write. Because then, back then, you know, uh, there was a newspaper called Just for Laughs that was in all the comedy clubs, right? And John Fox, uh, who who owned the Comedy Underground, he uh, he put out this newspaper, and it, and and so it was pretty widely read. But once his article about the competition came out, because he he ran Seattle and and San Francisco, so whenever the competition when the competition ended, he would he would they would have a big article in the Just for Laughs. Well, all of a sudden, I'm getting hired. Like I'm getting people people hired me off that article, and I wanted to say I'm glad you're hiring me, but I got 30 minutes, <laughs> so, you know, you might want to feature me, you know? And so I had to write quickly. So that was a huge thing because I had to write. I was being offered, um, if not headline dates, I was offering being offered co-headline dates, you know, where I'd go on before the headliner, but I'd have to do 45 or 40 and they would do 40, something like that, you know? Um, it just changed everything. I, 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 got, I got two TV shows soon after that. I got Star Search and Evening at the Improv. So yeah, winning that competition changed everything for me. Wow! Get, get just gaslight on your or gas <laughs> gaslight. That's wrong. Or gasoline. It poured gasoline. It did <laughs> on your career. It yeah, really did it forced That's me? Amazing. It forced me to get forty five minutes as quickly as I could. So I was going to ask then about like your tips or opinions about you know, applying for competitions, obviously you're going to have opinions are going to be very favorable for that. So <laughs> what, yeah. So what do you think about like, you know, should people apply sooner than later or should they wait till they feel like they're ready for a competition? Like what are you, what, what would be your advice for young comics now? Um, I, I think, I think, I think earlier is better because I, here's the thing. I think if you feel like if you feel like you can, you can, you have what it takes to go, then nobody really should tell, is there to tell you no. I mean, I mean, yeah, maybe in hindsight, you might do a competition and say, oh man, that the level of competition, I was, I was kind of 
in over my head. But I think for the most part, we know. I think comics kind of know. I mean, we say around other comics, we, we make sure and say we're we're doing well and, and we're, you know, oh, I just got to close that gig and everything. But I think when we're driving home by ourselves, we really do take stock in how we did, you know. I mean, like you and I were talking about the first time, you excuse it. And, and like you said, there's that, so uh, how, how'd you think you did, you know. <laughs> But I think after after a few months, you know the answer to that question. I, I, I really believe that, mm-hmm. like, you say to yourself, how, how do I think that went? Not well. Not mm-hmm. not really well. So I think if you think you're ready, um, go for it. Because there's really nothing to lose. There used to be a feeling like if I, if I expose myself to a certain industry person too early, they'll always have in their head, oh, that person's, that person's not very good. And, and there is that. There, that does exist. But the fact is... Um, not like it used to. It you that used to be the case because they were the gatekeepers, right? They 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 controlled all the pathways to to success uh, on the level higher than the clubs. But now that's not the case. So let's say you do a competition. Maybe you do a little too early. You don't do very well. There's an industry person who goes, oh, that person not very good. Not that that didn't go well. It doesn't matter because a year later, when that person has you know fifty thousand followers and is is getting you know getting a thousand likes per video, none of that matters. So they're not, they're not as much the gatekeepers anymore because the fact is if you can get uh, likes on your, on your posts and your videos in a certain town, they will bring, that club will bring you in. There's, you don't need a gatekeeper in LA to bring you out to these clubs. It's so, so I do believe go as early as you can. As you, I'm sorry, not as you can, but as you feel like. If you feel mm-hmm. like you're ready, go for it. And even if you're early, take your lumps, Go and go. Come back home and say, "Okay, what could I have done better? What do I need to do from here?" Mm. And this this reminds me of a, a topic. It it came up um, something that Benny Darso said that stands out the most in my interview with him. Episode one of the past episodes. I don't remember the number, but he talked about how and and I you know talking with a lot of comics, we always feel like everything's unfair and why did that person get that? I mean, and then your, your story is a really good example of that where you're like you're lightning in a bottle and you, you won when you, you know, even you said like, maybe I wasn't quite ready at that level, you know? And so, um, you know, what, what advice do you have about like, you know, timing and comedy and like the, the fairness of it all and, you know, how somebody accelerates really quickly versus somebody else who's working really hard and feels like it's unfair. Like what, what fatherly advice do you have for <laughs> young comic? Well, well, I'm not I'm not the um, the best person to ask, mainly because to me it's just about um, perseverance, and that's something I don't I don't really have. I'm not I'm not persistent. <laughs> I um, <laughs> I I remember one time we were, a bunch of comics were talking about auditioning, right, for for like acting parts and stuff, you know, and and, and or even even we were even talking about some comedy auditions you had to do not in front of an audience the kind of when you had to do a, when you had to do jokes in front of just three people mm. and we we're talking about auditions and and how everybody was saying about how hard it is and it's everything and i said and it's even harder for me because i agree with the people who think i shouldn't get the part i literally agree <laughs> with those people at the table like ah you're not that good and i said and and i said so at least you guys feel like you should have it right and that was kind of half joking but really truly what i feel so and I've seen, by the way, and I've seen plenty of people who varying levels of deserving it got to got to certain parts of their career be, just because they were, just because they they showed up and they were there. And and on that night where, you know, most of us decided to stay home and watch something on TV, they went. They went to some horrible open mic or they went to they went to some kind of, you know, some kind of thing that will, will help them along. They got out of the house and did it. And so that, to me, the perseverance is it. I, I remember one time, so this is, we're going back to the early 90s. There was a comic who was kind of barely headlining, you know, wasn't headlining the clubs in Seattle, was headlining triple runs, but not really in the clubs yet. Well, he got, he got Evening at the Improv. And a bunch of comics were kind of, kind of bitching. They were kind of like, you know, how's he get it? You know, blah, blah, blah. He's not even a headlining, blah, blah, blah. And, and we're all sitting around. And I remember another comic uh, who was, at the time, a veteran. I was like an open micer. And the other comic said, you know why? He's gone to L.A. four times to audition for it. How many of you have gone down to L.A. on your own dime four times to audition for a show? Any of you? Anybody here? He goes, we're all sitting around a table bitching. He's going down to L.A. He's meeting people. He spends hundreds of dollars every time he goes down there. 
And you know what? He got a national TV show, and he deserves it because he's been auditioning for them. And every time they told him, yeah, that's not quite the set, you know, take this out and put something else in there, blah, blah, blah. And, and you know, back then, you had to send videotapes. Well, they, even at the April, I was not going to watch your VHS video. They, they're not. You got to be in front of them. So he would, he would adjust the set, change something, and he would just do it at like an open mic at the underground or something. He'd work a five-minute set, work a five-minute set, fly down to L.A. Yeah. Then the third time he went down, he said, they, they said, yeah, we like this set. We'll book you. So, so this idea that somehow oh, he's getting opportunities, that we're funnier or I'm funnier or they're funnier, whatever, it doesn't matter because he went, he did it. He did what it took at the time. And that's, and that's why, like, you know, these, these comics who are, um, yeah, we could mock them because they're putting up a video clip every single day or every other day and, and just, you know, they're kind of spinning wheels. But you know what? All of a sudden, they're going to have a ton of followers. They're going to get into the algorithm. They're going to be seen by a lot of people. Who are we to say that, well, they're not that funny? It doesn't matter. It, it, really, it really doesn't. And, it, and then the other thing to that point is that worrying about what other people get, man, it's a great way to waste a lot of your time and energy. Mm -hmm. You know? I mean, I mean this, this thing we do, it's fun. It's hard. It's crazy. And it's nice that other people are going through it with us. You know what I mean? When, when comics sit around and, and listen to each other, it helps. It helps when someone, when I say, man, this booker, blah, 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 blah. And they go, yep, yep. Same thing. I get it. I understand. That's nice. But the fact is worrying about them being more successful or doing better than me, it just wastes so much time. Mm. Right? It, it really does. And, 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 you know, because the fact is there's a ton of comics who are great human beings, who are brilliantly funny, and who work really hard, who have made it. So I'm good with that. If a few people, I, I think maybe you know, shouldn't have gone that far. I don't care because some really great people have succeeded, you know, and, and, and so, so yeah, so I, I just feel like, you know, it, whatever you do, if it, if it succeeds, great, congrats. Even if you hate my guts and I hate yours, congrats, do your thing. Because for me, it doesn't help me to hate you. It just, because then I sit down and write a joke and if I'm thinking about you, I'm not writing that joke, mm. you know? Oh, I love that. That's so great. And I, I think what I'm, a lesson I'm taking from, the examples you've given Kermit is that push yourself by putting yourself in positions that make you stretch and grow as a comic. Yeah. That the, it sounds like those were some really big growth moments for you was when you had an opportunity to do something that was beyond your skill set, And so yeah. you took that as an opportunity to push yourself and expand. Yeah. And, and I mean, and believe me, I got lucky. It wasn't like I, it wasn't like it wasn't my plan. Right. I didn't, I didn't know I was going to make the finals in the competition. I hadn't made the semis the, the two previous years, so I, I had no expectation I was going to make the finals. But it happened, and then I and then I, I had no expectation to win, and that happened. So I kind of had to fill the shoes. So it wasn't like I you know worked hard and created the opportunity. The opportunity sort of got thrown in my face, and it was like, <laughs> if you if you want to take these gigs that pay more money than I'm seeing, you might want to write the, that extra fifteen minutes of material pretty pretty quickly. So, uh, yeah, it was, it was basically if an opportunity is given, you know, try and make the most of it. And that part, I got lucky. Um, so, yeah, perseverance. And it's funny, like I said, it's funny for me to say perseverance is important. Uh, and I'm not a very perseverant person. <laughs> <laughs> well, you didn't get, give up. You took, you, I mean, maybe you don't see that, but I see the perseverance in, in what you have shared too. <laughs> so, what, so now, Walk us through the, the TV stuff, the TV gigs, right? Because that used to be the ultimate goal of yeah, a comedian yeah. was to get a, you know, get on TV. Yeah. And that really isn't the goal or the, the end, end all be all anymore. So what was it like being, you know, being on those shows? Well, it was, it was incredible because, uh, first of all, put those on your resume, right? In 92, I think it was 92, I got both Evening at the Improv and Star Search on my resume. And what, what was amazing is the same set on that tape got me corporate work because they look mm. at they look at the five minute set and they go, Oh, he's pretty good, but look, he's been on national TV. And you're right, at the time that was a very big deal. So then I started getting corporate work and learning how to do that. And then the other part of it that was amazing was working TV is different. Um, and I learned a lot. When I when I first went to Star Search. I brought an outfit that the costume designer went, why, why, why would you want to wear this on TV? Like, I don't, I don't know. I, I, I thought it was a cool outfit. And well, what, well, you were still in your twenties at that time, right? Or 
Yes. Oh, uh, I was 20, yeah. 23 maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I just didn't know. And and then, and the other thing when they when they, you know, obviously they say don't look at the camera, but they started teaching me like don't play to the camera. Mm. Right. Not only do you not want to look at the camera, don't play it as if oh this camera's on. I'm going to kind of shift this way. Play like you do to the audience, and then the cameras capture that, right? Mm. And that seems it seems simple and it seems silly, but when you're on stage doing your first two TV shows, it's something you need to figure out, you know. Um, and so, yeah, there's a lot of these lessons where, like, working in front of cameras is very different, right? And and the other thing you learn when you're working on on TV shows and 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 recording stuff is that when you think you're going too slow, slow down a little bit from that because. Mm. Because what we do in the clubs is fast for television, fast. And and um, and I remember years ago when Ellen DeGeneres came to Giggles in Seattle, and I went and watched her because she was one of my favorites. And I watched her, and I re- and I was like, wow, she's talking so slow for a club comic. But then you watch her stand-up sets, and it doesn't seem like she's talking slow, but it's the exact same pace. Mm -hmm. But she would keep that same pace in the clubs because she didn't want to start rushing because then when she did TV, it would look too rushed, right? Mm -hmm. So there were things like that where it was was invaluable. I was 23 and learning lessons about working in front of a a camera. It was amazing. Mm -hmm. And is that similar to that when you're working in theaters or arenas that you also have to slow down your delivery? Yes. Uh, when when you're doing you do in theaters, when you think about the farthest person from you, so the for, so the person mm-hmm. in the balcony, the the sound has to reach them, and then their laugh has to reach you. Now, look, you're not going to hear their laugh, but the theoretical let mm-hmm. the let things play back and forth. I t- I talk, you laugh, it comes to me, I talk again, and whereas in the clubs, there everybody's within twenty feet of you, right? Mm-hmm. That's a different, you know. And so yes, it was it was very valuable to learn that lesson about about how to work certain venues, um, and you'd be surprised when you slow down in a theater. All of a sudden, you're like, "Oh, I'm doing way better than I normally would in this venue," <laughs> and it's only because the audience, when they feel like their laugh is going to be stepped on, they stop laughing. Or, or I'm sorry, mm-hmm. they laugh quicker. They mm. laugh and end because they know you're going to start again. Okay. And if you let them laugh, and then you start. Man, they're they're just gonna laugh like you know they're gonna let it go naturally, and that's the best, right? That laughter wa- wave. Yeah, yeah. There's, did you surf a lot when you were in Hawaii? Is that a stupid question? <laughs> no, not at all, not at all. I um, I, I did up until a certain age, and then uh, once I got into kind of sports, I, I didn't as much because it's uh, because uh, it, you know it can be dangerous and everything. So once I really and I was I was big time into sports. So mm. um, when I did go to the beach, I would uh, I would take my bike. There you go. Okay. There you go. Because <laughs> um, that's what it feels like for me. Like riding the wave of the laughter. It's yeah. that union of the comic and the audience, and you, you get in the right unison, and then it just. I've never surfed, but it just feels like <laughs> that's probably what it feels like. No, it really is, especially especially in the bigger venues, in in theaters like that. A- absolutely. Oh, where where what next? What what? Uh, d- now, when I talked with um, Miles Weber, he was talking about getting his dry bar comedy special and how that was like a, a something he'd wanted for a really long time, and then he experienced this like post success depression after that. Did you? have those where like you had these big highs in your career or did you just keep keep uh, uh moving up mount everest in your career what was <laughs> yeah that's kind of how it goes for me i i'm uh it's not because because i did i did pretty well on the dry bar thing i you know i mean there's there's a couple clips with you know quite a few hits like you know uh 12 million or whatever but it wasn't like i had this major like i wasn't selling out venues in a certain town right but I did notice that if I was working a club in that town, there would usually be a certain amount of people that came up and said, we've seen you on Dry Bar. We wanted to see you here. But it's not like, you know, uh, like, like Brad Upton's had huge, huge success with Dry Bar. And, um, and I'm so happy for him. That guy works harder than any comic I know, and he's brilliantly funny, and he's a great guy. So, um, so no, I never really had that. Now, now, granted, part of me, part of it is because I don't really pursue it on that level. I just don't, I don't know how. Um, 
but it's helped me a lot and i and it has built fans for me in really a lot of markets it really i there are so many markets where people recognize me from drywire um mm. and it's been great because you know they said this was going to happen i was one of the first uh the first batch of comics they did and they said oh we're going to do this and we're going to buy Facebook ads. We're going to do this. And, and we were laughing like, okay, good luck with that. You're going to buy some Facebook ads and get millions of uh, views. Okay. You know, like we were, <laughs> and they, they did it. They, they made it happen. I, so uh, hats off to them. And, and, and many of us are very thankful about it, but nah, nothing like that for me. Look, I don't, I, I don't get bummed when the, when the sign curve comes back down. It, it's just about how do I get it to swing back up again? Mm. Just because, I've been I've been around long enough, like 30 years, you pretty much see all the ups and downs. And I've had moments in my career where I thought, oh, is this it? Am I done? You know, am I, am I going to have to start putting out resumes? Because, man, it's slowing down a lot. And and so when you survive enough of those curves, you just kind of go, all right, don't don't let it beat you up too much. Just kind of keep doing what's what's offered. You know what I mean? Like even if even if these these corporate gigs or these whatever are stopped using you. I know someone down the street who's going to have me is going to give me stage time if, if I want like 10 minutes at their at their at their produced show. Right. And so I so I can go down there, see people I like, be around familiar people, do 10 minutes and don't feel the pressure of a corporate gig where they're paying you so much money. I got to be brilliant. And, and just remember, like, oh, yeah, that's what I love about comedy. Ten mm -hmm. minutes in front of 50 people having a good time. That's that's the best. Right. You just where, where you can just walk into a cool little venue um, and and. And and just kind of remember why you do it. So yeah, so I I don't I don't let it get me too down just because I've been around this long. So even look, if it ends tomorrow, Carol, it's been a good run, man. Mm. You know what I mean? I quit I quit in May of ninety one, so I so so I just passed thirty two mm. years as my only job. Is that right? Oh my gosh. Um, so so if it ends tomorrow, you know, I mean, it's it's been a heck of a run. I did not think in May of 91 that it was going to go 32 years, to be honest. I, I thought it would be like my backpacking through Europe. You know, I'd do it for a couple of years and then I, then I'd grow up at 25, 27 and, and be able to say I was a comedian, you know, <laughs> you know, so, so well, I, I, I sure don't get, get me too down. I sure hope it doesn't end tomorrow. Cause that means this show was the end of your career. <laughs> Let's hope not. <laughs> well, there's some things I'm planning to say that's going to get me canceled. So just okay. keep talking. <laughs> Finally, we get to see the real Kermit. <laughs> I just, so I, I love what you said there too, because I was going to, you you naturally asked a question I was thinking, just some advice about like when you have those highs and you think, and then, well, during the low periods where you're like, okay, what's going on? I love your approach that you're like, you just go do something that's an easy gig for you, but just fills you up that, you know, that you're going to get that like feeling of like, okay, no, I still got it. Um, so finding those, those, uh, those gigs that just fill you up the, you know, a little yeah. small thing that just yeah. shows you, no, no, I still got it. I can, I can crush it and get that feeling of like, just keep, keep going. Don't stop. You know, you know a long time ago, I had a headliner tell me one time, he said, he said the, one of the one of the biggest things to figure out in comedy it is what wastes your time and what makes you better. And he mm. said because a lot of times those two things look the same. Mm. And I was like, oh my gosh, right? So so if you think like like my scenario where I said if you just go down and do ten minutes on somebody's on a friend's show, it might just be like, oh, I'm doing ten minutes in front of fifty bucks for no money. But at that moment, man, I really needed that. I really mm. needed to just try some new stuff. Or work on something that I've been working on that in my corporate show I haven't been able to put enough effort into. Because, you know, corporate stuff, you can't really work on the new material. And so why don't I go down to this, you know, so, so a 10-minute gig for free might be just what I need at that moment, right? Whereas at other times, other 10-minute shows, it, it may not be, you know what I mean? So, so it's always constantly having to recognize what wastes my time. So like I said earlier, worrying about other people wastes my time and, um, and uh, you know, uh, worried because this booker is not using me anymore that waste my time but 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 then there are things that if i do this is this going to help me get better tomorrow or or is it just gonna am, am i am i treading water and wasting time here and man that that really stuck with me and i still haven't figured it out like i still will do something and go ah, i probably shouldn't have done that <laughs> you know or say something to you know or or get in some get in some argument on facebook that i'm like ah why did i do that that completely wasted my time <laughs> So what are the, some of the 
major pivots you've been you know you've been through so many seasons in comedy what are some of the major pivots that you've seen in the scene or that you've had to adjust to versus you know comedy back in the 90s versus comedy now well so comedy back in the 90s had way more money like i said Mm -hmm. but also comedy now has way more power like i said Mm. comics have more individual power because you can find followers without without agents and producers right um now they still help it helps to have an agent helps to have a producer but ultimately now the agents will find you if you have followers so so Mm. so there's less money but more power now um and then the other pivot that i think is absolutely great is the is the diversity of comedy um you know back in the 90s i actually had a club owner tell me that he said he said i want to have one black guy every six weeks and it keeps everybody off my ass that's what he said. Like, and, and you look at his roster, and it'd be four, four weeks of white guys, right? Nothing wrong with white guys, but it's very different. I saw a lot of women get out of comedy who were very, very funny, but just what they had to go through at the time, right? I mean, I don't know how many times I've, I've heard club, or, club managers say to a, a, a female comic, ah, that's just how he is. Like, yeah, but... That's not right. That's, I mean, that's just how, maybe maybe stop it. Maybe don't let them do that. You know, and and so nowadays, if 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 someone someone books a bunch of shows that that are all male, people notice it. People mm-hmm. it gets talked about, and and that's that to me is a good thing. Is that you see now? I mean, look, there was a time I think it was before COVID where the biggest draws were Amy Schumer, Dave Chappelle, Kevin Hart. Um, you know what I mean? It's like some of the biggest draws in comedy were, were either minority or women. And it was just an incredible thing, right? I mean, um, and it's made comedy better because I'm hearing voices and perspectives that I didn't used to hear. It, they just weren't in comedy. Hmm. And, and now, man, I hear so many different ways of looking at the world and it's made comedy better. So that's one of the, that's one of the pivots that I think. And, and by the way, I will say this too. <clears throat> we still have a long way to go and i mm. get that comedy is still very misogynistic and it's it's uh you know it, absolutely um we still have a long way to go but i want people to know that i've been around long enough to see that it has come a long long way it is it is great to see what's happening in comedy because now there are women in comedy that that would have had to quit um just just by things they had to go through and things they had to deal with um and where they were generally scared to walk into a comedy club. And that broke my heart at the time. And so, so to see that change now is absolutely amazing. As well, and I, I'm glad that I lasted long enough to see this. Do you have any fun, terrible show bomb stories? <laughs> I, I am. Um, I've had oh I had never bombed. Of, Kermit's killed every time he's ever <laughs> no, performed. No, 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 not, not, no way. Um, I yeah I had one where um, I was doing a college gig, and um, it, those can be tough when they're in noon. You know the the, the lunch college gigs can be tough because you're standing in the cafeteria, and maybe some people have come to see you, but most have not. And um, and I you know I just didn't know how to how to deal with it right. And so I was twenty. Uh, I think this time. Oh, this is right after I quit my day job. So I was like 22 or 20. Yeah, 22. And um, oh, my God, this is embarrassing. So I used to do a joke about uh, I used to jo- uh, about Barry Manilow music. And I don't remember what the joke is, but it was probably really bad. And, um, <laughs> and, and so I was joking about Barry Manilow. And there were these, there were these uh, black students at this one table who were just not listening. They were just, they were just talking to each other really loud. And... And, but I'm just doing my thing to almost nobody, right? Like maybe there's eight people listening. The rest of the cafeteria is either eating, talking, or studying in groups. Like I'm literally interrupting them. So there's these black students there. <laughs> and I did my little Barry Manilow joke. And, there's one, and the one kid from that table goes, Barry White. And I went, yes, he is, sir. <laughs> Which I thought was hilarious, right? <laughs> and... <laughs> and and this guy now wants to fight me. Oh, yeah. No. And so his, he's coming up and saying, his friend, I'm like, I'm going to get killed. His friends were kind of stopping him and everything, but they were barking at me too. 
They go, oh, you racist, you racist. I'm like, no, I was making a joke because I, <laughs> I said Barry Mantle, he said Barry White, and I said, yes, he is. And um, I thought I thought I was making a funny joke. And so it just got really bad. Like the people who the people who booked me, they kind of came up to say, you know what, you're, you're, you're done. You're done. <laughs> <laughs> Probably and good. So, <laughs> and so I walked with them to the student offices, and they literally were like, you need – you need to go to your car. You, you need to go like, and, and, and they weren't wrong. These guys were going to find me. And so they, so I, they kind of walked me to this door and I went out to my rent a car and I took off. It was like, yeah, it was really bad. It was. And, and the funny thing was I, I was thinking, Oh, this is a funny joke, but to who Kermit, who's going to laugh at this joke when there's hardly anybody is listening to you in order to, in order to do something like that to an audience member, you have to have other people on your side. You can't be alone and make that joke. Cause now, yes, you look like a racist. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so that, that was one I'll never forget because I just thought I'm being hilarious right now. That's a funny line. Uh, but it wasn't at that moment. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But really, I, I would never forget the, these people coming up. So his friends are here and the people, the, the, the student activities people are right here. And I'll never forget this. You're done. You need, you need to go. You're done. And they're like, they're like trying to get me to walk off stage. Did you get the check before you left, though? <laughs> um, I did. That was the other thing, too. I called my college agent. Look, I just want to let you know what happened. <laughs> like. And I said, I'll still pay you the commission for it, but I don't think I, we're going to get this check, but I will pay you your commission. And, oh. And uh, they wound up paying. I, I was very surprised they wound up paying. So I just want to know some I, I guess I had done like 20, 20 minutes, you know, and so the, I guess they thought, well, that's enough of a show then. <laughs> yeah. Gigs like that that uh, baffle me of like. Like, why do they think that's a good environment to put a comedy show on? And there's so many examples of that, of like, hey, let's just do a comedy show in this thing that isn't conducive, you know, to all the things that make a comedy show work. But they just keep happening, right. and they're so rough for comics, but I'm sure they're well, learning well, in opportunities, the, in too. In the college market, one of the reasons is because if they don't spend the budget, they don't get it next year. Mm. So there really is like, okay, we can't, we can't, get, the, um, we can't get the theater on this night that we want to do a show. Okay, let's do something during the day, right? <laughs> and the thing is, if you have like, let's say you have like a a, a band that's not really an inter interactive band, right? That doesn't need people to sing along or whatever. That would be great. You put them in the corner of one area, people can come listen. And if, if, you're, if you're studying over here, they can play their music. You know, it's not as bad, but but they go, Oh, we could bring in a comedian, then we won't have to have all the all the bands set up. We, we'll just it just have to have one mic and we're ready to go. And and then we can spend that money and we don't have it. So I would get a lot of these gigs towards the end of the year. I would get like April, mm. May college gigs because they just had to pay. They had to, okay. they had to get rid of it, you know. Um, but, then, but then the ones that aren't doing that, yeah, you're right. There's no excuse for that. <laughs> if, if you're going to have comedy, try and make it work. <laughs> well, I think it's it's fun because it's uh, people that enjoy comedy will book that. Like they think, oh, I'd love to see a comedian, but they're so clueless about all the different nuances of, yeah. of what makes a show work, you know, the low ceilings, the low light, the, you know, little bit of inebriation in the crowd, you know, <laughs> like those things are important to, yeah. for a lot of shows to work. Yeah. And then, and, and in corporate gigs, you know, having the comedian after they're done eating, like people, mm. don't, people don't realize it's, and I've had, I've had pushback on that to the point now where I just say, okay, but just let, just let you know, you, you'll know that I'm trying hard and you'll know that you saw me do well. So, and the thing you saw me at, they weren't all eating at the same time. So just to let you know, because I've had people say, like, no, it's going to be great. Oh, okay. You, you think when people are eating that they're going to make loud laughing noises. And uh, and it's weird because they might like your jokes, but they're not going to laugh while they're eating. They're eating, mm -hmm. right? And also eating is conversational. You're hanging out with people at an event. You're eating. You're having conversations. It's not. It's not conducive to I'm going to listen to everything about that guy's life while I eat. You know, it's not. And yet, and yet still people push back and okay. All right. It's hard to laugh with a mouthful of food too. Yeah, yeah. right. <laughs> I, I showed up once at a, uh, a gig and it was, uh, you know, they had monthly shows there and for whatever reason, this one month they decided to have a band before the comedy show. And so we get there and everybody's dancing and up and having a great time. And then, 
And then we're like, oh, this is not going to go well because nobody's going to want to now sit down and be quiet <laughs> and not move and listen to comedians. It was like, uh, do it the other way around. Yeah. Comedy first, then have the band afterwards. We, um, <laughs> we did, a, a, we, we rolled into the Cat's Paw in um, Bozeman, Montana. I'll never forget this. And um, the, the club owner's there during the day and we just checked in, said, we're here. And, uh, you know, because you, you, you would always come into the venue, say hi, and then head to the hotel. So we come in and we're talking to the owner. He goes, oh, it's going to be great tonight. It's going to be packed. I said, oh, that's wonderful. He goes, yeah, we're doing 10 cent beer. <laughs> oh, boy. I, oh, no. No, that's not good for comedy. Do that for music, you know. Oh, my God, Carol. It was, I told, I told the, the, the feature act, I go, I go, look, this will be one of the hardest gigs you ever do. He goes, you think so? I, I think it'd be fun, man. They're going to be they're going to be having fun drinking. I go, not at 10 cents. You cannot. <laughs> I said, I promise you, this will be one of the hardest gigs you ever do. But just stay up there. Just talk. As long as nobody's like threatening violence, just know that you're doing well. If if, 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 if nobody's attacking you, you're having a good show. He goes, <laughs> and he went up and it was so loud. You couldn't hear him through the mic. Oh, you wow. You couldn't hear him. And so... And so when he got done, he just looked frazzled, right? <laughs> Even with my warnings, he was still, he just looked frazzled. So the guy goes up to introduce me, and he's coming off stage, uh, the feature's coming off stage. And I, and I said, hey, if this makes you feel any better, I got to do twice as much time as you. Because <laughs> like, he had to do a half an hour. I have to be up there for an hour in front of the <sighs> loudest screaming and, and like, and so what I was doing, what I decided to do was, look, I'm just going to find those few people right? okay so, I, so I, I said i said all right is anybody listening to comedy at this point and that kind of point and they and i so i just do jokes towards them and make them laugh and it was so loud in there i had to scream to the mic for an hour uh but it turned out not being an hour because two fights broke out in the room <laughs> <laughs> and luckily nobody could hear me so nobody was mad at my jokes they they were just two fights broke out and so the owner comes up to the stage she goes you can wrap it up whenever you want you know it's up to you you don't you don't have to stay up there and i went okay i said well, how about five more minutes and he goes great and so so i said all right for the five of you listening uh i'm gonna do the big finale right now you know and i saw the five of them kind of clapping like you know and, and so i did about 40 45 because it got mm. It got crazy in there. It, it was like insane, and um, and uh, yeah, it, it just. Why would you think ten cent beer night would work for comedy? And he was so excited. Oh, it's going to be packed in here tonight. Ugh. Oh my gosh! Did was that the last ten cent beer night, or did they? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I called Tribble the next morning. I go, hey man, they're doing a promotion. I don't think it really works for comedy. <laughs> so so. I don't know for music, but I know for comedy, Triple said, don't, don't do that. And the owner was like, yeah, you're right. It did not go well. <laughs> oh, good. Yeah. Glad it was mutually uh, agreed upon because sometimes <laughs> the owner's like, no, it's great. We're going to do it again. <laughs> right. Right. We were packed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh. So I promised at the beginning, I was going to find out you've performed in 47 states, yeah. Yeah. which are the three that you've not performed in. Okay. The two, uh, uh, up northeast, uh, uh, New Hampshire and Vermont, and then West Virginia. Okay. And uh, I, I ran into a comic uh, who I hadn't seen in years, right? And and he uh, he said, "By the way, did you ever get all fifty states?" And I said, "I said no. Nah, I think I'm at the time I was at forty six. I hadn't I hadn't been to Maine yet." And um, and I said, "No, nah, I think I'm at forty six. And he goes, "Oh, cool. You're gonna try?" And I said, "Eh, you know, I." I I don't know if I want to rush out to to West Virginia just to, you know. And he goes, can I tell you something? He goes, that's the best way to look at it. He goes, you know, I got all 50. And I went, oh, congratulations. And he goes, yeah, and you know what? No one cares, Kermit. Nobody cares. <laughs> <laughs> and I started laughing. He goes, he goes, it's a novelty. Like, you know, it'll be like someone might ask you, how many things you performed? Oh, I performed them all. Like, oh, that's really cool. And he goes, and that's it. That's the conversation. Yeah. <laughs> it's not like making it in just for laughs magazine where then everybody's booking you on everything. Like, Oh, he did yeah. 50 States. Now let's open up the books for him. Yeah, exactly. And, and he was like, he was like, now Kermit, you're from Hawaii. So you go there all the time. I had to book a show to lose money to get 50. 
And all I get out of the conversation now is, oh, cool, you did 50. That's nice. Um, you know, and it just it just really sat in my head. And I thought, okay, there's no rush. I don't need to. If they if they happen, they happen. But I'm not gonna I'm not gonna chase West Virginia because because he's right. No one no one really cares that much. I mean, they do. It's it's nice. It's cool. But it's cool for about three seconds, and then it's just all right. Let's talk about something else. You know. <laughs> oh, that's a, that's really funny, right? No, yeah, yeah. no. Well, and it fits well with your like, yeah, I'm just not that am- ambitious and uh, uh, pursuing <laughs> goals. So it's perfect. That is, it does kind of fit my character. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I never thought of that. Yeah. Actually, I want to not do 50 because then that would be discordant with my persona. Yeah. Yeah. That would, that would almost be an accomplishment. That's, that, yeah. that doesn't sit well with me. It doesn't, I don't wear that well. <sighs> oh, that's great. <laughs> Well, in, anything else along your journey that you feel like would be interesting to share or, or provide some some insights or tips into this crazy skill you know, I, we're all working on? I, I, well, the, the main tip I would give is to look for advice from people way more successful than me. I, it, that would mm. be my first tip. But, <laughs> but I, I would also say this. So I don't really, um, I don't really give comics – advice because I want to be that guy who sits in the back and tells every comic what they should do. Um, But I will say this. I love talking about comedy and I, and I really enjoy it. And I've had comics come up to me and, and say like, Hey, what'd you think of the set? Or, you know, or can I pick your brain about something or, uh, Hey, I'm I'm starting to get offered these kind of gigs like corporate or cruise ship. Do you have any advice? I love talking about comedy. So, uh, you know, I, the fact that I'm not giving people advice at shows doesn't mean I'm not approachable about it. I enjoy talking about it. So, um, uh, if I have a tip, it would be it would be that it would be that that you know some comics enjoy chatting about comedy. We you know we're in this because it's a passion, right? Nobody gets into comedy at first to be a, to be a millionaire, right? It's really about <laughs> like it's fun to do. Uh, you meet people who are weird just like you, and, and you kind of like being around it, and and you like and you like making strangers crack up. It's a, it's a beautiful feeling when you make total strangers laugh at something you say about your life. So we all share this passion, but um, so I would say like if 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 you have a question or if you have a concern or you, or you have something that you want to get advice on, ask. And some headliners won't. Some headliners they don't want to be bothered with things, but. There are many of us that we love talking about. It. We love talking about comedy, and 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 so uh, that w- that would be my my main tip is that there are resources, there are people willing to help. When when you work with comics, uh, you can you can learn a lot from them, uh, especially the off stage stuff, the stuff that's sort of harder to figure out. You know, on stage we can we can figure out our own way and how we how we build the show, how we build our act. But off stage, man, you can never tell if you're making the right decision. I shouldn't say never, but there are a lot of times where you can't tell if you're making the right decision or if you're saying the right thing. Mm. So, so yeah, yeah. Look, look for advice because, man, I, I I think about so much advice I've gotten over the years, and they've saved me a lot of time, right? Because mm. I would think, oh man, if I had to, had to learn that lesson on my own, that would have taken a while and some lumps, you know. So, <laughs> uh, so yeah. Especially, especially me. If you ever want to talk about comedy, people people can reach out or anything. I I I I do love having those conversations. Especially if they bring you pie, right? <laughs> well, if, <laughs> if you bring me pie, you get comedy conversation on a foot rub too. I'll some <laughs> oh. other stuff. <laughs> oh. I thought of one other question I meant yeah. to ask you as well too. So yeah. we kind of ask the closer, and then we're going to go back and do a little bonus one here what what's your writing process like so you know when you come up with a premise or an idea all the way to it being a solid tight joke what's the process like for you okay let me say first that my writing process is not one that people should use it's really (laughs) not smart um (laughs) it's so basically i have a premise in my head maybe i jot down uh, like a two or three word premise about it Maybe I don't. Maybe I just keep it in my head and let it bounce around. And then one night I'll take it up on stage and riff on it. Like I'll bring it up mm-hmm. and see what comes out. Because I noticed that I could. I used to write a bunch of stuff on page, try it all, and it just sucked. Maybe one line was decent. And then I would just tag it because the lines were so bad, I would just try and tag it. And those would get laughs. Mm-hmm. And 
and so I started thinking, is my brain like most functional when I'm on stage? You know, mm-hmm. so that's what I'll do. I'll come up with an idea. Like I'll say, I'll think, okay, this. Uh, if I said this, you know, to somebody, or somebody said this to me, and then I reacted this way, okay, that's the premise. Then I go on stage and say, you know what happened? I was in, I was in this, and this happened, and I say that. See if I can come up with anything. And if I can't, move on to the next thing. And I'll do that for maybe three or four times, and then write it down, and then mm-hmm. start jotting down like, okay, this has a thing, this has a thing, and it was a way to keep me from wasting the time of writing a page full of punchlines that all suck. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'll find different angles that can work as angles, not as specific punchline, but as angles. Like, OK, when I talked about this premise, when I went this way, did they follow me on that? Did they like that? I mean, the punchline wasn't great, but at least does that have does that have the meaning that I need? Right. Or when I turned it this way and moved it there, did they like that? So then that's when I start writing it down and then you flesh out the things. Um, and. I should say this process is months. <laughs> it is really <laughs> too long. I need to do this every damn day, but but I will a, a bit will sit in my head for a while, a few weeks, a month maybe, and then it'll be tried a little bit somewhere in the middle, just messing with it, and then it'll be written down, and then I'll start trying to form it as a bit. Then I start okay, so this angle works, this punchline works. Okay, so where do we go from here? Do the tags come here or do they go there where what's going to happen with the bit so this is months down the road so like i said i don't recommend it i really recommend jotting down the idea and writing some premises or writing some jokes immediately um but for me it was just i felt like i was wasting time so i I go on stage first i i I don't think there's any right or wrong answer it's figuring out what what works for you and so that's my intention here is to ask remember to ask people what their process is like and so that you know younger comics can kind of play around with different things and figure out what works for them. Cause I know in the beginning I wrote everything out word for word and rehearsed and practiced. Yep. And then the feedback I'd get from more veteran comics was like, you sound too rehearsed. You sound like you're in a play or something like that. And I'm like, well, how do I undo that? <laughs> and part of it was just more stage time. And then I kind of do what you do now is that I'll have an idea and I'll maybe write a few things, but I'll go up and just kind of riff on it. And I find that's a better way for me at least at actually getting to memorize the joke and the flow more than trying to rehearse a script and then perform it. And so, yes, yeah, yes, that's a good way to put it. That's exactly right. I, I want to have it to where I'm telling, a, I'm telling this story and it, and it works this way, but I don't get that when I just sit there and scribble. I don't, mm-hmm. it, it just, it becomes like an essay I wrote about this premise, right? Ah, that's, yeah. a great, that's a great way to put it. That's, that's how I look at it is that I want it to be a conversational thing that once I take it to paper, then I write it conversationally because I've heard it said out of my mouth. And, and, and that, that then I can hear, like, does this sound like a bit or does it sound like I'm talking about something? You know? Yeah. Well, and then there's tools now that will transcribe what you said. So I'll use that, like, what I said, and I'll plug it into this software, and then it will type it out for me. It saves a lot of time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then go back in and figure out the things but you know maybe in 10 more years maybe my process will change again as well too so <laughs> no but i like the way you say that because that I, I think that's why i've done it this way because it, it finds it finds a more conversational tone which and, and also my natural humorous reaction to something right because mm. maybe when i'm jotting down the page maybe i'm writing a comedic reaction or what i think a comedian would say here right but when i'm just talking about on stage without a real like a uh, bunch of punchlines, then I'm, then I'm kind of having to be me and finding, finding the punchlines. Right. So I, I, I like the way you said that. I, I think that that kind of does explain why I might do it that way. Yeah. Well, anything else in closing? It's been such a pleasure having you here, Kermit. Uh, I, I, I've been, I've had a great time and I, I thanks for letting me ramble. Oh, no problem. What's your, I forgot your, uh, I Kerm. Oh, the website is I com. I got, I, I got that in like the nineties. I, I know that. it looks like it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Everyone go check out, um, his website and you'll be transported back to 1994 <laughs> right. top of the line website. I love it. Uh, I com. uh, show dates and, uh, 
you oh, can yeah, order VHS update. tapes of his performances. And <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and by the way, the uh, um, and on the social media, everything is Kermit Apio. Like okay, that name is always available when I sign up for social media. <laughs> <laughs> is I uh, your first name is very unique. Do you have a fun story of how your mom? Oh, she just does. She didn't like the way Kermit was pronounced. She didn't like the okay. pronunciation. So. Uh, so she spelt it with an E because she liked Kermit better. It was it was it is a oh. misspelling. Nobody spells it that way, but but she liked she liked that spelling. All right, well check him out. Follow him on all the all the socials. And again, thank you so much for being here. This has been great. So much value you've given to me and to all of our audience members. Thank you everyone for being here and watching and listening. And we'll see you all next time. Bye now. Have fun getting good. <laughs>